Hello, welcome everybody who is already online. And ladies and gentlemen, if you could find your places, then we could start. On peut commencer avec la, la session de clôture de cette belle réunion que nous avons eue ici. En fait, la dernière, les dernières conversations urgentes sont encore en cours. Mais en fait, cela est très représentatif de, de notre rencontre au cours des trois derniers jours. Alors maintenant, euh, oui, les derniers délégués regagnent leur place. La communauté en ligne est présente. Ce serait peut-être un bon moment aussi pour dire que c'est magnifique que vous soyez tous ici à Berlin, pour toutes les personnes qui sont ici dans la salle. Mais il y a quand même 1 600 personnes qui nous ont regardé euh, mardi et puis un millier hier. Ce que je veux dire par là, c'est que voilà, ce forum global sur la protection sociale adaptée, euh, eh bien, c'est quelque chose qui attire vraiment l'attention et euh, bien entendu, le but étant d'augmenter les alliances et d'arriver euh, à plus de personnes partout dans le monde. Alors voilà, euh, bienvenue, bienvenue aux personnes qui nous euh, rejoignent. Ministre Scholz de l'Allemagne, eh bien, Merci, merci d'être ici. Come to all the other ministers that have been here in the last three days. Welcome to everybody, to the delegates that have been working really, really hard. You know, we've had two hosts uh, for this, um, this conference. Uh, we had the World Bank on one side, and then we had the German government on the other side. And Actually, the minister was one of the driving forces for this gathering here. So uh, it is wonderful that the German Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, Svenja Schulze, is a here. And um, just to let you know, she's just come back, as the UN would say, from mission. Uh, we would say state visit to India. And uh, she's been talking to many ministers at the G20 meeting in Delhi there. As I said, the driving force behind the conference, and that uh, is uh, quite a question of conviction. Uh, she herself is highly interested in social protection. And this year, her new strategy, the feminist development policy, brings added impetus to some of the questions that we have also discussed here, some of the gender transformative issues that we had on our agenda were actually sort of inspired by the special viewpoint. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would love to ask her on stage and with your applause, say hello to Svenja Schulze, Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development. Excellency, so ladies and gentlemen, dear Axel, Axel von Fürstenburg, it is really a pleasure to have you all here and see how engaged you are in the discussion. You all know social protection is one of the most effective instruments for protecting people against poverty, and societies which have a social safety net in place are better able to weather crises. And this is something that we have learned from experience, most recently from our experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is another reason why adaptive systems are so important. And this conference has convincingly shown us that social protection uh, creates security. As a social democrat, social justice is especially close to my heart. Inequalities within and between countries have to be removed, and this is another case where social protection is one of the most important instruments that we have. It makes a major contribution towards reducing the gap between the rich and poor, but this can be done far more effectively if it is combined with a progressive revenue policy locally and globally. 
if countries use the instruments of spending policy and revenue collection to reduce the social gap. Ladies and gentlemen, you are gathered here today as experts on this topic from all over the world. Come together to share your knowledge and your expertise. Let me use this conference as an opportunity to tell you about a new international partnerships. Uh, six months ago in Berlin, the idea war for this new partnership was born in a collaborative effort with the World Bank and the ILO under the umbrella of the UN Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transition, the new partnership will enable partner countries to develop their social protection systems and pilot adaptive approaches. And in order to finance this work, I am pledging 7 million euros from the budget of the German Development Ministry. We want to use this commitment to provide interested partner countries with swift support for, this, for strengthening their social safety nets and for crisis prevention. Germany will also make further financial support available for this purpose in the next few years. And I would like to encourage you, ladies and gentlemen here, who are representatives of other providers of ODA funding to participate in this initiative politically and financially. I have already received positive signals from some of you, and that is also a positive outcome from the last couple of days. In many countries around the world, social protection is dramatically underfunded. Many of the countries in the question are in the global south. Many of them are partners of the BMZ. Social budgets need to be increased and governments are responsible for doing that because social protection is a core task of every nation state. And it pays off because it is also an investment. It makes it possible for people and economies to develop to their full potential, and it makes societies more crisis resilient. Going forward, the de de development ministry will step up its efforts to make sure that people are protected against health risk and against the consequences of pandemics. Adaptive social protection plays an equally important role in cushioning the impacts of climate-related damages. For example, when this means that, women, that a woman who is a small farmer is able to buy new seeds after a drought. In the Sahel, where we are supporting the, de de uh, the development of social registers in a joint effort with the World Bank, the World Food Program, and UNICEF, I have seen the difference this makes with my own eyes. Strong protective protection systems ultimately benefit all people because they strengthen social cohesion and make it possible for people to participate in society. But women and girls in particular benefit from universal access. In many countries, they are far more affected by poverty and in addition, they are dependent on patrial power structures and that includes being financially dependent. Social protection makes them more independent. And that is why inclusive social protection is also a building block of my feminist development policy. Of course, as with all reforms, the real challenge is in implementation. How can social protection systems be made to adequately reflect local condition, especially in fragile contexts? How can the potential of digital solutions be fully used, for example, in order to manage social registers and pay benefits quickly? What capacities to do administration needs to develop for this? All these questions and many others have to be discussed at this conference, and I am really impressed by the spirit, by the, by the enthusiasm which is with you, dear Gast, um, and how you have dedicated yourself here to these discussions. The outcomes are very, very valuable for my ministry and they provide a basis for us to new, 
the discussions uh, and to, the, to, to bring the next steps forward. And that is what we want to do together. Thank you very much for being here and for your engaged discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. We're looking forward to seeing you in the panel discussion in a couple of minutes. Uh, but um, we are on day three of a long gathering, intensive discussions everywhere. We had four plenary sessions uh, in which we discussed the four pillars, the four building blocks of social protection. We had four parallel sessions, we had hundreds of side conversations, and then that's probably one of the difficult things of actually getting people back into the auditorium. And we have two people with eyes and ears that have been listening and watching, and they're now going to bring us the highlights of this conference. And they're just laughing because they say, it's a monumental task, of course, and we're very much in awe, and I'd rather say you than me. So uh, let me just quickly introduce these two daring experts. Uh, it's Esther and Colin. Esther Schurich, she is a social protection advisor at the GIZ, and her work and her passion was always the area of social protection and insurance, whether in academia as a professor or as somebody who instigated a master program on exactly that issue, writing a book uh, on uh, social uh, protection systems or having now returned to the GIZ as social protection advisor. Colin Andrews, program manager of the Partnership for Economic Inclusion, hosted at the World Bank. He's got 15 years of experience on the ground and at the global policy level. And when I say on the ground, in Africa, in Asia, you name it, he was there. Ladies and gentlemen, give both of them a big hand to come up here on stage. a remarkably kind introduction. Thank you very much. 58 countries, 56 presentations, 15 international organizations, right? 343 currywurst, 832 coffees, and 900,000 travel miles. It's, it's a lot to take in. We're going to try and summarize briskly and succinctly the key lessons and what's different but it's a hard task, and we ask for a little bit of help. Video. So we want to start off with a policy that will have the legal framework, the legislative frameworks, and the implementation plan of how to roll out adaptive social protection in my country finds fiscal space within the government national budget. In the next years, a single social registry needs to be implemented everywhere in our regions to know the exact number of uh, people that we need to reach for economic inclusion. It's adaptable as we go along that the people can be able to take advantage of and that the technology works for the people and meets them where the needs are, especially as it considers people who might not be able to read and write. In Costa Rica, we're going to finalize the diagnostic that we're doing to start. In Costa Rica, we are going to finalize our ongoing diagnosis to uh, finish this process. This process must have three fundamental variables. One is equity, another is opportunity, and another is resilience. And we also think that our system has to be adapted in order to be very intelligent, smart, dynamic, highly transparent, and above all, to generate many opportunities of inclusion for the population. Sustainable innovation of existing system, we have to reform and work it out to make it more uh, workable and more uh, attractive for all the stakeholders from the beneficiary part and from the governmental and from the other uh, partners who are delivering the services. In the next three years, we would like to have an updated dynamic database available 
to ensure the inclusion of all the people, not only inclusion, but regular update of the socioeconomic status so that we can reach out to the affected population well in time. To achieve an efficient integration of social information systems to determine the living condition of the uh, households and thus designing protection, prevention and social promotion policies. Thanks, thanks so much to all of the presenters for being game with us over the last, uh, the last day to do that. A couple of high-level messages before we get into some of the things that were different than what we actually learned over the last uh, three days. We are at the midway point to the SDGs. The degree to which we will get there and achieve them by 2030 is up for debate. Much has been done and there's more to do. So we're here on the back of some tremendous successes highlighted in the first day. We've had the largest scale up of cash transfers in global history through COVID. We've had a surge of programs building on established delivery systems over the last three and four years, building on foundational investments. And quite different to previous events, we have a very rich diversity of programs and delegations represented in the room, spanning low income countries, middle income countries, and also fragile and conflict affected contexts. That's the good news, but there is much more to do. We are on shifting ground. We present the conference at a moment of poly crisis, food price inflation, price shocks, which is making us think much more carefully about food security and nutrition security responses. International labour mobility is changing and it's shifting the way that we are doing business regularly. The forced displacement context, the number of international uh, forced displaced populations has increased significantly. And as a wider backdrop to this event, we have the climate change agenda. And not only us within our sector on social protection, we're thinking about climate change, but the world of climate change is starting to think a little bit more about human development and human capital and what that means to them. So where are we? Where do we take this agenda forward? One thing that's been resoundingly clear in the last couple of days is that there is a call to action to scale up our adaptive social protection responses. And there are a number of high level considerations before Esther kicks, it, kicks us off with the key lessons that we have learned that we want you to keep in mind as we go through this presentation. First, we need to keep, focus, we need to keep a focus on foundational social protection systems. We cannot have an adaptive social protection system without the social protection system there in place already. This helps us to define um, who needs benefits when and where. The agenda here is unfinished. Expenditure levels are modest, coverage levels vary throughout, and the adequacy of the response in our approaches is more under question now than it's ever been before. But the second consideration is that there is recognition that the adaptive agenda is going to be an important anchor for us to achieve that SDG goal in terms of how we adapt and how we move forward. And the final consideration that struck with us in the course of the last couple of days was the idea that we're no longer just talking to social protection practitioners. The agenda is being carried much more cross-sectorally. We are talking to climate change experts. We are talking to the fiscal authorities, to technology experts, to the food and nutrition security. So the good news for all of you delegates, as you think about this cross, it's not your cross just to carry, but it's increasingly a shared agenda. All right, and we want to leave you actually with six messages that we can also encourage you to tweet. So I will start with the first one. The first one is on gender. And it's also, it highlights a twin challenge that we've seen uh, through the crisis. On the one hand, women and girls are actually much more vulnerable. On the other side, they are least protected. And crises have shown that actually vulnerabilities get exacerbated, that inequalities get cemented. But at the same time, crises are also a moment of opportunities, of opportunities to actually shed more light on these inequalities and opportunities to also take more innovative actions. And a lot actually has happened in the past years. Gender is much more on the agenda. So there is greater awareness now 
that every policy response we take has gendered impacts, whether by design or by default. So a public works program without childcare services is not very child, uh, gender sensitive, it's actually gender blind. Or a program that only grants exclusive access through digital means can be gender discriminatory in nature. Secondly, there's also now much more awareness that we need gender disaggregated data. And it's also encouraging to hear that now the uh, World Bank big <laughs> database Aspire um, has a consideration for that as well. Thirdly, we th need to think about more comprehensive approaches. We need to go beyond just nominating women as cash transfer recipients. But we need to think about access issues throughout the entire delivery chain. We need to think about counseling services that women need, skills that are important that maybe they might be lacking also in comparison to their male counterparts. And we also need to worry about childcare services so that they have the time in the first place. And for adaptive social protection to be truly transformative, we also need to think about the gender norms, the discriminatory structures that are in place, as also Minister Schulz alluded to. So where does it leave us now? We have, I would say, an agenda <laughs> with gender, but not a lot more concrete action needs to happen on the ground. And for that, maybe some of you might also feel more comfortable knowing that um, there is now uh, a guidance note coming out on how to make adaptive social protection more gender um, sensitive or gender transformative. And secondly, I think we also need to take this agenda beyond gender and worry more more about making social protection systems and also adaptive social protection systems inclusive in nature. So worrying a lot more about who gets excluded and what we need to do to integrate them. As a reminder, please feel free to take out your phones and to live tweet. Um, if you're going to use your phones, certainly live tweet and start a virtual conversation. Right before COVID, we had a last learning event on adaptive social protection, and a lot has changed since. The conversation in 2018 focused hugely around the programs, and we've talked a lot about the programs, but now we're talking about the systems, and we're talking about the linkage between the two. And critically, with your tweets, we're talking about the connection between the short-term response and the long-term response, and what that means from the adaptive standpoint. We're talking about building on established delivery systems to do more and to do better. The graph is a familiar graph of some of the gaps in our strategy to achieve a universal social protection approach, and it calls for greater flexibility and integration. But let's focus on the message of opportunity. Adaptive social protection is changing to the zeitgeist. We are coming out of the COVID response. We're in the midst of a policy crisis, and it's forcing us to rethink our goals and our strategies towards getting towards resilience, towards equity, and towards opportunity. It's putting a greater spotlight on the inherent exclusion within our systems and the lack of coverage for many different people. And the idea of opportunity gaps is coming very much to the fore. How do we make these connections to economic inclusion and to jobs? And critically, how do we complement existing cash transfers, which take time and effort and investment and remain critical? But how do we do more to achieve these gaps in our overall strategy? I want to talk about a different connection, and that's a digital connection. So we also need to connect the digital dots. And I think the conference has been really eye-opening in this regard. We've seen many countries that have actually moved from the Swiss cheese that we saw on the first day to actual digital systems. And what does digital system really mean? So here there's a greater focus on the nodal points of this map. So it's no longer just focusing on the journey to get from one point to the next, but really looking at the entire map. Looking at the entire digital ecosystem from actually the entry points, the data registries, all the way to integrated service delivery. And focusing also on the data governance. And that's something we need to be concerned about. And that's also something we should not just leave to the ICT guys, as we heard. We need to be concerned about data quality. We need to be concerned about data security and privacy. And we also need to be concerned about the use of data and how it gets interpreted over time. And why do we have to do that? Because there's great potential actually to be harnessed. 
if we are successful in doing that, we get the speed that we need for adaptive social protection. It can help us save some of the costs and we can invest them in also making the systems more inclusive. It can make systems more accountable through the transparency. And in some ways it can also get us the political buy-in that we need. So where now? Of course, in order to make that happen, in order to have that functional map that we're seeing here, we need to invest. We need to invest in the interoperability of systems. That involves cost and also, of course, capacity development. We need to also make these systems flexible over time. And we heard, for instance, from Pakistan that they moved from a survey approach to on-demand mechanisms that helps, of course, to keep data updated. We need the trust. That's also something we heard in making those changes. And last but not least, we need to make machine-driven processes also human-centered. So many hopes and dreams, but who gets to pay? The IMF came with bad news by their own admission, but they also came with some good news. They reminded us about the fiscal constraints, the lack of fiscal headroom, and various constraints at the middle income as well as at the lower income agenda. But they also gave us a nice tweet to think about. They reminded us to explain that let's flip the script on fiscal space and financing because adaptive social protection is macro critical. These are investments which complement the wider macroeconomic framework within a country. They can help put us onto a path of inclusive growth. To do this, the social protection investments, of course, need to be sustainable, adequate, and effective. Of course, our country delegations were not so far behind, and this wasn't a major news flash to all of our country delegations, and thinking particularly about the cases of Senegal and Egypt and uh, Malawi that we heard yesterday. A lot of discussion and the answers are not quite met in terms of where this financing revenue will come from, but a couple or many considered discussions. A great discussion on the role of domestic resource mobilization and the potential for direct and indirect taxation and how that works, whether it's progressive or regressive, and why discussions on that front. Questions on resource allocation and prioritizing the most effective interventions when you need them most and how. So many conversations on the subsidy reform agenda and what this means. And as you look at the cost of subsidies across a range of countries, can you do more to complement that with existing social protection investments? One of the big game changers that we didn't hear as much four or five years ago was on the disaster risk financing and what this means. And sometimes it's made us kind of anxious as a community because we're bringing in new experts, new thinking, new language, indexation, anticipatory cash financing into the dialogue. But it's there and it's real and it's bringing in a new community to work with. And it's critical with the climate change agenda. So the discussions that we have had around the Global Shield, around the Global Accelerator, matter highly in this regard. And then some outstanding questions, not just on the role of external financing, but the effectiveness of external financing and how external financing complements a national financing strategy over the long term. Because we're not in this for three or four years, but it is a long-term incremental financing agenda. Let's gamble together on social protection, adaptive social protection. And some of the gambles, of course, need to take place in countries. And we heard about the importance of political commitment. We also heard about the difficulty sometimes of generating political commitments, as um, Stefan Decon highlighted. It can be a battle. But I think also the conference highlighted that we have a couple of tools on how to win this battle. So first of all, we heard from Indonesia, for instance, that maybe we need to make a clearer investment case for adaptive social protection. We heard from Egypt and Zambia that maybe sometimes we can tweak programs a little bit, make different design choices to make them politically attractive. And last, also, we can maybe use digitalization a bit more strategically to also get the political buy-in, because digitalization progress is something also that politicians like to align with. But the gamble is not just taking place, of course, in the partner countries, and they're not in this alone. We heard that we're all in this big bubble, right? And this is comforting. So there are many partners, actually, that will also gamble along. 
And we don't only do this for the knowledge products, but we do this in various areas. And let me just highlight maybe two. In terms of digitization, a lot of focus has been on digital public goods, also developing uh, common standards across. And this is something where we truly stand to gain if we join forces. Same for financing as well. We also heard that some of the countries will struggle to actually foot the bill alone. So it's again reassuring to also see different initiatives. We heard about Malawi also, where there's a multi-donor trust fund where resources are pooled. We also heard about the initiative now from Germany to also have more integrated financing mechanism to ensure coherence across. But let's also be honest. I mean, sometimes partnering is not always easy. And actually, we made this experience ourselves just trying to put together this 20-minute presentation. It can be challenging sometimes to join forces. But it's also effective. It can be fun. And I think we also owe it, of course, to partner countries that we don't add to the fragmentation of programs, Yeah, that we, as cooperating partners, also rally behind the legal frameworks the policy documents and bring in our comparative advantages and strength. Thank you, Esther. Yes, even in the course of this PowerPoint presentation, we've seen impressive power play from the Germans <laughs> at many different levels, so it's to be encouraged. <laughs> um, what's left? Thank you for bearing with us. Uh, this is the final slide uh, that we want to present. And we want to leave you with a message that we're not starting this from scratch over the last three or four years. Let's take a step back and let's look at what's happened across the social protection practice since the early 1990s. And this is a layering of the presentation that Mikael gave purely on the social protection investments from the World Bank side itself. When I look at a slide like this, I think of two things. We are adaptive by design. Adaptive social protection didn't just come up in the last three or four years. The role of social protection has adapted from the lack economic crises in the 1990s. It's adapted from the Horn of Africa experience in the early thousands. It continues to adapt from the experiences in Sahel, and we're adapting at the moment from the poly crisis and from COVID. But the other really important message to leave you thinking about, and that was underpinning many of our discussions over the last few days, is that learning is in our DNA. OK, sometimes that's a problem. There's a saturation and there's a whole cottage industry of experts exploring every different facet of cash transfers and social protection in particular. But there is a very important evidence and learning agenda, and it's important to complement these large-scale financing amounts with investments in knowledge and making the knowledge work for us. Some of the gaps we learned about in the course of the presentation uh, over the last couple of days was the evidence and climate risks and what we're learning from the early starts on the um, global shield work in Malawi as well as Sierra Leone and having space to share this information. Learning more on cost effectiveness. So many delegates discussed cost effectiveness in different sessions. And finally, uh, the importance of collective sharing, the importance of just being able to gather, to discuss, and to learn, like we're doing now. And I think we were invited back to Berlin in three or four years uh, on the opening day. I'm not so sure if that has been fully confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, very quickly, one last uh, slide before we hand the mic back, actually, to you as the audience through another video, and also then later on um, to the expert panel. Um, just to show that we have still have a common vision, right? We know where we want to go. It's a complicated picture. We've actually made some progress, maybe also with this conference, and this can be shown on the right-hand side. So we've left actually the abstract picture and uh, sort of the, the color is uh, interweaving, and we've tried to actually box some of the lessons learned into the right place. So we have provided some structure, but of course we're still very far away from the bigger picture, right? And so for us, of course, it's important now to focus on what's next and also to get some further recommendations on the next steps. And for that, we would like to listen actually again to the audience voices and we look forward to the closing panel as well to also provide their thoughts on this. Social protection systems are very important, but my advice is that we want to see that they have a long-term impact 
an outcome for the vulnerable and uh, the less fortunate people in our societies and communities. Je pense qu'il faut commencer déjà par mettre I think uh, we need to ensure coordination around everything that has to do with social protection. If there's a penny, we need to put a penny plus a penny into all the sectors because you know there's also health, education, everything needs to be coherent. Two main recommendations that we have is uh, the following is one to communicate the process and whether where we're going towards and the other one is to take into account the adaptability of this system that every country needs to build for uh, coping up this uh, shocks that every country is facing this, especially the climate shocks so that is the only advice have your data updated on a regular basis in the end local ownership is very important and digitization is the way to go. To promote, enhance our information systems as key tools for the development of the adaptive social protection. Think about the small local adoption, which based on ecosystem and value added. Smart use of all the stakeholders, uh, services, and every single uh, economic or social empowerment initiative in the country in one whole platform. I just wanted to congratulate you on putting together three heavy working days uh, with a partially humorous but very content-driven thing. And I can only say as a TV pro, that was real good work. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, the next gentleman would have liked to have been here on the panel, uh, but he can't. Um, there are a couple of things going on in Geneva right at the moment. Uh, it's the ILO's annual conference, uh, and today, actually, it's the World of Work Summit. So, Gilbert Ngbo can't be with us now, but he was so nice as to answer a question from us, and uh, he prepared a statement that we're going to play in a second, uh, because we asked him, what is the ILO's thinking? And I'm sorry, we have already heard this this morning, but in a nutshell, and from the boss, uh, we're going to hear it from the managing director. What is the ILO's thinking about expanding coverage uh, of social protection and ensuring a just transition? And this is what the Managing Director of the ILO has said. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be able to speak to you today on this important issue. I would like to thank both Germany and the World Bank for this opportunity. And please allow me to congratulate Minister Schulze and the German government for their leadership in making universal social protection a priority for the multilateral system. Today, 685 million people still live in extreme poverty, the majority in sub-Saharan Africa, and in fragile and conflict-affected economies. This situation and many similar deprivations are unacceptable in our world today. Building universal social protection systems is clearly imperative for two reasons. First and foremost, universal social protection systems shield people from the worst danger they experience in their everyday lives. They help to prevent poverty and to reduce vulnerability and inequalities. And secondly, as this forum highlights, they caution the impact of shocks and crises such as conflict, natural disasters, or economic recessions. In this context, it is more than ever important that social protection systems are effective and adaptable to changing circumstances. Yet, 
many countries are still without strong systems that can meet these requirements. Often, the problem is a lack of fiscal capacity, especially in countries with populations most in need. So we must do more to help developing countries provide universal social protection. Dear colleagues, your forum coincides with two important related events at the ILO Annual International Labour Conference in Geneva. The first is a general discussion on achieving a just transition to environmentally sustainable economies and societies. The second is the World of Work Summit on the theme of social justice for all. Universal social protection is rightly at the spotlight in both these discussions as a precondition for decent work and social justice. It is also the core of the UN Secretary General's Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions. This multi-partner initiative focuses on removing major obstacles to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. It supports countries in their effort to create at least 400 million decent jobs and to provide social protection to the 4 billion people who currently lack such support. It aims to put people in a better position to anticipate and to manage the different transitions that are coming, social and environmental, as well as economic transitions. Our joint efforts and your forum show that momentum is building behind the cause of universal social protection. By working together, we can accelerate progress towards social justice and give millions of people the chance for a better future. Thank you so much. And of course, it's a thank you to Geneva, to Gilbert Umbo, and of course, all the team. Ladies and gentlemen, on the way to the panel, uh, this will be the last opportunity for me to say that there have been more people documenting uh, the conference. And uh, I know that there were a couple of you who actually asked me, you know, what about all these PowerPoints? And yes, there were a couple of fascinating presentations. They will be available for everybody, certainly for everybody who was uh, registering. So uh, you will be getting an email when that is available on a website and uh, uh, so you will not miss any uh, dots or any figures uh, you can read them uh, the promise is out at the beginning of July but you will be informed okay so now having done that having done a little bit of housekeeping I'd like to invite uh, our minister to come back on stage in order to start the panel discussion and I would like to then fill up uh, madam yeah 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 I'm, I'm going to give them a big entrance so big entrance for the minister <laughs> And the next person, and uh, we have been saying that they, the German government, i.e. the ministry and uh, the World Bank have been standing side by side. So let me get him up on stage, the senior managing director of the World Bank, Axel von Trotzenburg. And while you're coming up, you're responsible, sir, for development policy and partnerships. He directs the World Bank's core development work captured by the World Bank's global practice groups, oversees the work's numerous partnerships, including with the UN, international finance institution, bilateral partners. You're also uh, the man to represent the bank at uh, the COPs, uh, i.e. in the climate discussions. And I could go on and on and on. Maybe I should still um, talk about the evolution roadmap that you're heading. But please forgive me if I stop here, because then I can't. Then I can also introduce the others. So I'd like uh, to get the, the minister and the lady up on stage, and maybe we'll just quickly put this over here, and Mr. Duff next to you. And with that, could you please welcome, with a big applause, Shazia Mari, uh, Pakistan's federal minister for poverty elevation. And
and social safety and social safety and a member of of course the federal cabinet of uh, pakistan and we've heard during the co conference uh, madam about the benazir income support program uh, you're uh, actually the chairperson of this uh, which we have learned is the largest social protection program in your country but also really well known around the globe and um, on a personal note congratulations that you were one of eight people out of women being re-elected directly to the Pakistani um, General Assembly. So, <laughs> last but not least, and welcome back on stage, uh, Eddie uh, El Hadi Ndiogo Ndiof, uh, General Secretary at the Ministry of Community Development, National Solidarity, and Social and Territorial Equity of Senegal. Uh, and with that, <laughs> you might. You might uh, need your translation devices. A long history of working with the Central Bank and West African states on economic and financial programs supported by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, advisor to several prime ministers, but I think in this context, and uh, that gives me the chance to sit down, it's quite important to know that you have personally uh, been very uh, much engaged in the recovery after COVID-19 uh, and uh, been spearheading the Force Fund and Economic Social Resilience program so thank you very much okay having done the introductions um, I'd like to uh, address the minister first uh, I mean uh, the minister of Pakistan uh, <laughs> no 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 um, we, we have a sort of script so I'm gonna start with you um, and um, uh, Minister uh, Mari we have heard over the last couple of days a lot about, and we've just heard it in the revamp as well, financing, digitization, localization, amongst others. Um, your country, and we've heard all the disasters um, uh, hitting uh, Pakistan, um, floods and droughts again now, and high temperatures, uh, is highly hi vulnerable to climate change and witnesses increasing frequency of that. So. What role do you allocate to adaptive social protection in dealing with these problems? And what are your expectations, I mean, this is the forum, uh, to the international community? Well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I didn't have a mic like yours. So first of all, thank you very much for having me. I would like to um, appreciate um, the, uh, the government of Germany, uh, and particularly uh, Minister Schulz, her efforts, and uh, the other partners, World Bank, GIZ, who've come together to uh, put this great event here in the very heart of Berlin. Thank you very much for giving us an opportunity of being here. Uh, as you've rightly highlighted the fact that Pakistan is uh, uh, prone to climate shocks, and uh, we very recently have experienced uh, devastating floods of 2022. But prior to this also, in 2010, 2011, 2020, and uh, as I'm speaking to you today, we are facing the threat of a cyclone by Perjoy in Pakistan and neighboring India. So we are still today facing the same uh, climate uh, crisis and effect of the same. Uh, and as I speak with you today, prior to coming here, I was being asked questions about this cyclone. I was getting updates and at, at Pakistan standard time, 11 p.m. We are expecting this to hit some part of Pakistan. So uh, this is the state of affairs in terms of climate crisis that a, a vulnerable country like Pakistan has to face. Being amongst the 10 most vulnerable countries in the world uh, facing the impact of climate change, climate crises, as you may call it. Um, 33 million people displaced last year, 4 million children affected, uh, more than 600,000 pregnant women affected in the flood affected areas. Luckily, we have a state of the art social protection uh, system at the federal level in the form of Benazir Income Support Program, which was initiated back in 2008, enacted upon in 2010. 10 and World Bank just uh, put up a slide here showing in 2011 they also 
partnered with her uh, with us and since then up till now we are partnering and we are grateful for their support so far we do also have provinces of punjab and sindh who've established their social protection delivery systems which uh, work closely with benazir income support program so um like you said how are we dealing with these issues the existing social protection delivery systems uh, were designed to provide both conditional and unconditional support to address immediate economic and human capital related challenges faced by poor and most vulnerable households however the basic building blocks of social protection system uh, such as the national socio economic registry uh, biometrically verified payment mechanisms and technology based grievance redressal system can be deployed to address climate induced shocks as well so we we feel that this there is now a dire need for us to work towards uh, this but uh, we are blessed uh, uh, with the mechanisms that we've put in place from 2008 up till now we've evolved into a very successful social protection um, sort of mechanism that we are today back home uh, Uh, so I, I i not only sort of when i come here i not only come with the desire to learn from the 58 countries sitting under one roof but i also come with this pride that i have a system in place back home that i can share with you and i can offer you know more development cooperation in this regard so pakistan is willing to open up to to you know um sort of share its own experience with the rest of the world wherever whoever uh, wants to learn from us because we know what it is uh, like uh, with the, i mean we know what a catastrophe is but not having the mechanisms in place is a bigger catastrophe so today when we speak at this very stage we are happy to share uh our experience and uh, and and uh, achievements to date so we uh, we take um, you know great pride in saying that our efforts today have given us a data registry of 35 million households in pakistan so that's a very very big exercise and effort that has gone into doing what we have today um now for example during the recent floods like we were talking about catastrophes and earlier during covid pandemic we expanded the social protection system both vertically and horizontally to deliver cash uh, within days to millions of families in a most transparent and objective manner very recently if i am to explain to you 2.8 million families Benazir income support program reached out to in trying to give them the cash transfer that was announced by the government of Pakistan immediately as soon as this this devastating floods hit us and we were the first agency out there so you know that's the kind of challenge but um maybe maybe you can uh, explain about that or go uh, a bit more into a deep dive later on is is yeah sure but i want to yeah. i want to touch upon the nscr so if i do that and then quickly we can move on to your other question uh, you know the national socio economic registry has the technological ability to add layers of data uh, we plan to work closely with disaster risk management related institutions in the country to be better prepared for emergencies and that's where we are headed now um we also think that uh, the key example how the existing social protection system can be and is being transformed into an adaptive social protection system and how it can contribute to national efforts for addressing losses caused by disasters uh, is is the kind of um, sort of approach that we have today back home and like i said we are happy to be here we are facing a crisis back home but we would like to use all opportunity to learn and share the experiences that we have today thank you thank you so much fazia uh, <laughs> minister mari now to minister schulz <laughs> um uh, i I've, i've i've said already that that is social protection is close to your heart and 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 your attitude um and Germany has already responded to some of the challenges uh, that we've just heard uh, Shazia Mari uh, point out. Um where would you say are your are the ministry's priorities as far as adaptive social protection is concerned? 
Yeah, I think that was really an, an outcome here from the conference. We had that just in, a minute ago when we see these six points. Social protection systems help to, to break through the poverty cycle. And it is in the, in the, in the core responsibility of a development ministry to work against uh, poverty, to work against hunger. And um, social protection systems are uh, really the, the, the focal point on that. So uh, what, what we are doing is work on different levels. Uh, one is the institutional level. We, we need a better coordination uh, between the donors, between the ones who who want to bring things forward, uh, who, who, who take social protection systems uh, in, into account. We need more finance on that. Uh, the financial level is important. Um, generating uh, own funding for social protection systems in our partner countries is an, an, a huge step forward if we are able to do so. So that is the second part. And, and to establish social protection systems. Um, that is what we are doing here, um, driving things forward, uh, thinking forward what is going on, and using data. Uh, it was mentioned before that uh, data are really uh, important and that we do need to have more data and that we need digital convergence. It, it was named uh, in point three in, in, in the summary. So I think that is really important. We, we, in the last few months, my impression is that we go steps forward, that it, that topic raises more on the uh, agenda because everybody knows about uh, how important that is. And bringing that forward, I, just a minute ago, I, I talked about the Sahel region, how important that was to bring donors together in that region. And that was the first step, and we need to do more about that. Or Niger, in, in, in Nigeria, we, we, um, in, in Niger, we were able to bring together the World Food Program, UNICEF, and the World Bank. And we are much better in joining our forces. And that is also in the core here of the conference, joining forces, learning from each other, making more, more of the money we have, uh, and uh, asking for more of the money. <laughs> that, that is uh, what is the core of what we are doing. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, uh, and one can actually feel your enthusiasm uh, for that, uh, Monsieur Diouf. Um, uh, the Senegalese government, um, and you've already shared a bit of that this morning, but please, uh, even if you have to repeat a couple of messages, do. Um, uh, you have started to develop uh, adaptation strategies, mainstream adaptation into development planning. Um, so how are you going to do, take that forward in the midterm and in the longer term. And then, of course, the second tract of questions is about how do you interact with uh, the humanitarian stakeholders? Uh, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I represent Senegal here, but I think that I'm speaking in the name of all of Africa, and this is a great responsibility. And thank you very much for giving me the floor in this last round table. I think the time has come for social protection, really. We are right now in a, in an unprecedented uh, context. Never before uh, had we suffered so many shocks. Uh, the pandemic, first of all, which was uh, unequaled, and then uh, there's uh, climate change, and then there's uh, economic shocks. And uh, these are great challenges, but of course, they also have opportunities. And today, we have more partners available because many of them are much more aware about the importance of social protection. And today, there's this universal consensus about the need to place social protection as a priority and to have a financing mechanism. We have green financing as well under development. We have uh, also illicit sources of financing, but we do uh, have uh, many opportunities for financing. In Senegal, we have a social protection system which is harnessed, I would say, or relatively harnessed, because we have instruments to provide family grants to households, and uh, this within a life cycle approach. 
which is we consider the evolution of every individual throughout his life, when uh, during childhood, but also uh, during adulthood and early elderly ages, also people who suffer from disabilities, people who are victims of disasters. So this is a quite harnessed system that we have, also thanks to the support of the partners. And we have our single social registry, which works very well. Now, the only difficulty that we have is financing when it comes to a disaster. And uh, because when I have a look at the interventions for many different partners, yes, indeed, we're placing our focus on social protection. But the response uh, to crisis, to disasters, uh, is, is maybe uh, the leftover situation. And uh, because it's more difficult than to respond to people in vulnerable situations. And I think that in order to overcome this uh, obstacle, we need to provide methodologies when it comes to uh, crisis management and disaster management. I think I have heard that there's uh, this mechanism for financing for floods in many other countries. But in Senegal, we do not have the capacity to develop this kind of system which exists in Asia because in Senegal we do not have as many floods as them and also you know, yes, we do have floods, and when we measure this with biometric data, this is maybe lower than in Asia, but the impact on the population may be higher than the impact in Asia. So we need to think about these instruments to trigger the right instruments for people who are in these situations. There are many projects in the pipeline, and there are inclusion projects. Their projects to generate revenue. And if we add up all these projects, well, I think that we could have ensured some coverage when it comes to attending these vulnerable people. But the problem is to, well, the outreach of these projects and the difficulty to coordinate all the small pilot projects and to scale them up. And uh, we all agree on the need for collaboration. This is really important. But we also need to organize collaboration. And at a national level, in the structures of the state, and I already said that before, the state needs to become organized with all the different parties. We need to make a much better planning. If we don't have a planning, no partner will help us. So social protection without financing, this is a very delicate issue. Because, of course, you can target people. But if your governance is weak, you're going to generate more inequality. So this is something that we need to tackle on coordination at a national level and also at a sub-regional level. Somebody said that. I think it was a representative of Mauritania. And when it comes to sub-regional institutions, we also require coordination there. Let's think about legislation. I'm going to give you an example, universal coverage, health coverage. We have a sub-regional legislation that obliges us to reform all the health insurance system. And this allows us today to face also trade union movements. In the past, it was difficult to undertake reforms regarding this issue. But now, we can normalize this. And uh, thanks to all this sub-regional level, we were able to standardize this. So I think that we need to act at the sub-regional level and at the national level, and of course, international level with all the partners in order to mobilize much more and fight against the vulnerability. I haven't finished here, but I will have the chance to develop much more. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Axel von Trotzenburg. Um, we, we know that the World Bank has made adaptive social protection a priority now. And uh, we've, we've seen the timeline. We fortunately do not start from scratch. Uh, but um, where do you actually sort of see the, the, the line going on? We, we saw it stopping in 23, but let's look forward. Uh, what are your midterm, what are your longer term um, perspectives on adaptive? social protection and, and the stresses, of course, on the adaptive. Well, before, let me first uh, uh, congratulate uh, the Minister Schulz and, and the whole uh, 
um, your whole team here at the ministry for convening and organizing this uh, event. I think this, uh, there is an incredible need of a dialogue. I would like to congratulate Esther and Colin for uh, really summarizing in absolutely spectacular form the thing, so congratulations. Now I'm ask, asking, <laughs> what do I have to add? <laughs> but it's very well done. Um, I think, look, uh, first to, uh, I will get to the social protect. Let's all keep in mind that the SDGs are hope hopelessly off. And so what we need to think is that when we are thinking of social protection, we need to think of many other things at the same time as well. This is no longer a single issue. But there are interesting things on social protection. And, and when you saw uh, the, uh, the chart, uh, the bar chart on World Bank commitments on social protection, and there was something interesting, not because it's the World Bank, but basically what you are going to see is once 30 years ago, this was a marginal topic. Mm. Then it started to get into um, middle income countries, Mexico and particularly Latin America. What's interesting in there is, well, some people may not be familiar, but it showed IBRD lending is mainly to middle income countries and then for IDA lending. And that was the dark blue. The dark blue uh, ch uh, uh, gra uh, 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 chart went up exponentially. What that means is that actually social protection problem, uh, 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 systems have been more systematically introduced in low income countries. And that is good news. That is good news. And you just mentioned, for example, Niger. So this is something that is um, uh, absolutely essential that social protection system are not middle income or only OECD matters, are global matters, including low income countries. And we need to build systems. So this is very, very important that that, that, that diagram showed us. So there, the work is cut out because what we are seeing is that we are still not reaching a lot of people. Mm. And, and that means that we need basically to say how to bu uh, build those systems. And then there comes the challenges. Uh, they are different at levels for middle income countries than for low income countries. For many of the uh, uh, low income countries, there is even more than ever the whole link between short term and, and, and longer term. When we are looking at the food security, sometimes people think, well, we need to give, bring some food. Apart from what I told the board, that it is in a scandal in itself that we are today still presenting project on food security. Because 50 years ago, the international community pledged that we would eradicate hunger in 10 years. We have utterly failed and it's shameful. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't act. But the action is not only that you say, well, I have some food. It is you need to build systems in the short and the longer term. And that it means agricultural system. Because actually, if you have a good agricultural system, it may actually provide you more social protection than a government-sponsored thing. So what you want to have, you want jobs. You want to create it. So therefore, what we are arguing is you need to think that in a more complex matter, but it is actually a very, very important thing. The second is to, to make, make sure the financing is there, and particularly for low-income countries, that is a huge challenge. They have to do also their share. And some of you mentioned about domestic resource mobilization. I think you also mentioned that uh, uh, taxation levels are very, very low. Having said that, let's be also honest. With the COVID crisis, uh, basically the OECD went into high gear and, uh, and they were able to spend uh, at the worst crisis 12%, 14% of GDP, mainly for social protection. And this was the right thing to do. Mm. And then the low uh, middle income countries were a bit uh, 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 better, maybe with 6%. The low income countries barely hit 2%. And they were left out. And you see also the extreme poverty. So what we need also to say, we need to be very much aware that this discussion uh, is, is necessary because it is 
it is a source of hope, but it's also a, a, a realization that we are not there yet, and particularly in many countries, that we have to continue to learn, build better systems, and make also sure that we can actually react in the short term and fast but at the same time, never lose the longer term perspective. This is one of the challenges also in the World Bank. When we are talking about poly crises, and well, the big risk, and I guess it is the same in your ministry, you could be ca caught up the whole day only to talking about the crisis, but there is a longer term agenda. And so we have to consciously force ourselves also into this longer term, uh, uh, term dialogue. And I think that is this type of conferences are serving a purpose, is not only to do what you do in the short term, but in the longer term, because that is where we make the biggest difference. Thank you so much, Axel. And uh, I, I'd like to sort of uh, to open up the discussion uh, with Svenja on, on one issue that is actually not new. I mean, we were always talking about women in, in uh, development, but um, uh, the, the new focus is um, a, a different one. It's a different quality. And, and you've just introduced that as a strategy for the ministry and find, uh, if certainly if I uh, remember that your Twitter uh, said you had a lot of alignment in the G20 just now uh, with, with colleagues, mostly female colleagues of yours. So what is the special... Uh, feminist development policy, how does that tie in with um, the uh, adaptive social protection mm. system? Yeah. We heard that in the, sum, uh, in the, summer, by the summer, in the first point, girls and women are more vulnerable to shocks, but least protected. And that means we need to do more, and we need to do that more in a strategic way. And therefore, I, I launched this uh, feminist um, development policy. In a nutshell, it means more resources, more representation, and more rights for women, because that is not only good for the women, and the girls, it's good for the whole society. It brings justice forward. And that is what, what I like to do in all the fields where my ministry is working. And in social protection, it is really important because we know uh, women and girls, they, they benefit a lot from social protection systems. And that the problem is to get access to these social protection systems. And working for that, that means bringing women, bringing girls in the system, bring them more perspective for their own life. And uh, that is uh, what we do, for for example, in Sudan. We, we have their um, a, a development program that, may, uh, that, that names 1,000 days. Um, we have 50,000 mothers that get 1,000 days help just for the first 1,000 days with the new child. And that means a lot having um, someone who gets uh, help for the first days of a child's life, uh, that means a lot for, for the women, for the moms, and for, for the child. Or in, in Bangladesh, we in, introduced an, an accident insurance scheme for workers in the textile industry. Mm -hmm. And most of the workers in the textile industry are women. And if they have a first insurance just for an accident, that means a lot. We are all aware uh, of uh, 10 years ago about uh, the, the big fire in Bangladesh and uh, what that means to, to the, the people. So bringing concrete action forward, that is more than speaking about that there is a difference between men and women. We need to act and work for social uh, protection, and that is uh, what I do with my ministry and what I would also like to, to bring forward in the field of social protection. Thank you very much. And uh, on the way uh, to Pakistan, let's make a, a stopover in Senegal. Uh, and uh, Mr. Diouf, um, how much is the gender orientation uh, also mainstreamed into your programs that you're setting up right now? And how do you want to carry it forward? Yes, I think we are convinced that women are what is needed for developing our countries. In our single registry, we have uh, 
fifty percent of households who are managed by women, so that everything we do to ensure family uh, safety has to do with women. Then we have specific programs dedicated to women regarding inclusion and uh, revenue generating activity. So all these programs are meant for women. We have a ministry of women and children. And apart from my own ministry, the Ministry of National Security, Social Equity, and Territorial Equity. But we also have a life cycle approach, and we specifically take a close look at women. So our approach includes this gender uh, value since women are especially vulnerable, but they have a lot of potential to gen to, uh, to 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 get jobs, learn how to get a job, and ensure uh, st stability in their households. Uh, address Shazia first uh, uh, on on because I would like uh, you to dig a bit deeper than you did up to now. I did stop you earlier a little bit yes, because we wanted to hear a bit more uh, about it at at this point. Um, the the uh, Benazir Income Support Program is um, already a role model on uh, gender orientation, and you were earlier saying, you know, this is what we can share. In a nutshell, what could others emulate? I mean, what is your approach? What could others try and do that you have already been successful with? Thank you. Um, you've rightly said that we've already got a program which from the very beginning was very um, um, gender friendly. And um, with Benazir Income Support Program, starting with the vision to support the low-income households, there was another plan, and that was to empower women uh, to not only provide the support, but identify the women in that particular family as head of the family to qualify to receive this support. And you know the name of the program is Benazir Income Support Program. It is named after a very popular, courageous leader of Pakistan who was the first prime minister in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So the program, you know, is named after a brave leader who happened to be a woman. And the word Benazir means matchless. So you know, it has got some beautiful meaning as well. And I, sitting before here in, uh, at this stage before the audience, I am the first federal minister for poverty alleviation and social safety. So, you know, uh, so we are all sort of, uh, we, we, are, we are in the right place and we are on the right path, um, which is why uh, we didn't need to be sensitized as to uh, when and how would we make it more gender responsive. We started with the very realization that we are going to be supporting the women and you know, change the mindset in a conservative society. So I would say that this program was very revolutionary in nature. If you are to, if you are to study the impact of this program over 15 years, and we are in the 15th year, you would it is, is, it is amazing to see how things have changed. How, you know, in a family where women uh, were not even recognized for being there or the existence was not, not enough, you know, sort of not uh, visible. How the very importance of a woman in that family uh, was highlighted just because she was required to qualify for this program and none, none other in the family, no man, no boy, no, uh, you know, no boy child. So, and then we started two conditional cash transfer programs, one related to health, the other related to education. And here also, where we are helping uh, a boy child and a girl child, but we are laying more emphasis and giving more incentive to the girl child. So it is very gender friendly and gender responsive. Um, 
because we give an increased amount, like I said. Now, what, what I can, and I was also going to quote the same thing as uh, um, Dr. Esther put, the girls and women are, are more vulnerable to shocks but least protected. But with our program, we are ensuring that that protection is available to women and the girls. And we want to now go one step forward. We are looking at now working with the adolescent girls and their mothers. So this is, our, our, this is the future for us. So we are not waiting for a woman to be married to qualify to become a recipient of Benazir Income Support Program. We are going to be focusing on the young girls who are going to become mothers for tomorrow. But for us, we feel that they can be the agents of change. We feel that if they are focused and if they are uh, you know, given the proper counseling as to how and what are the challenges in future and how to better equip themselves or, uh, to face those challenges, we will have a more healthier uh, environment or, or sort of, you know, like you say, the hands that rock the cradle are the hands that rule the world. So we will strengthen those hands well in time and not wait for that stage to come where we bring in pregnant women, uh, you know, lactating mothers and their infants. So we are going a step forward and starting uh, much before we reach that stage. And that's the vision for us. What I can, I, can, um, um, I, I can sort of offer others or advice, I would say that start gaining high um, uh, political uh, level uh, support mm. for, for gender responsive programs uh, where you know, the actions are um, affirmative, where uh, you have positive gender outcomes. Uh, design programs where everyone has to take actions for positive gender results. So we had this program where we were starting, but we were not probably, we ourselves were shocked to see the kind of results we gained or, you know, over the period of time. So I'd say get more political support for such programs and design these programs whereby you predict the change that takes place, which is more gender friendly. Uh, I would also uh, suggest that, like Pakistan, currently um, is, is uh, uh, leading adaptive social protection effort through the ministry in place that is poverty alleviation and social safety. So I'd say have more of these um, sort of key roles in the government that as to who is going to be taking care of this. Because you know there are many efforts scattered here and there. But if you have a clear mandate with a given ministry like we have and we can, we can happily uh, share with you that today we, we are leading an adaptive social protection exercise under this ministry. So these are the kind of things that I can sort of share and offer others. Thank you so much uh, for doing that. Uh, Axel, um, uh, whenever you have something new, and uh, let me say certainly the term adaptive so social protection is policies and thinking behind it. Um, then you have sort of you have to have it gender sensitive, you have to have it shock sensitive, then you have it nutrition sensitive. You were just talking about agriculture. Um, is there nowadays a danger that the panacea is overloaded with all the expectations that surround it? Well, I would say no, uh, and, and I think it is the way you design it, the way you present it and explain it. Things are linked together, and uh, I think um, uh, the minister, we, we just talk about the gender dimensions. Um, if we leave the gender dimension, is you're going to weaken this program, as, uh, you know, significantly, and maybe you even um, lose it. Uh, so one of the things is I think a, a lot of people will appreciate it, that you that you explain it uh, when you are talking about social protection systems and that you see that in a broader social framework. And I think if you were there just to take the gender out or, for example, that you are not promoting female labor party participation, which is a huge issue, or that uh, you are uh, not dealing what we 
have been pointing out on the learning poverty, how many girls are left out of school. Mm. This is risking a whole generation of it. So where are you then? What kind of social protection system are we talking about? So then I think we need to, to really put this down. And, and, and I think uh, people will uh, explain. I, uh, I think it is not the overloading. It is sometimes the lack of ambition. I think we need to be super ambitious that we have to find a way to uh, reverse uh, these declines, particularly with the SDGs, and we need extra efforts. And it, has, it is a collective effort wherever you sit. It's not an organization, it's not a government, it's all. It is the private sector, civil society, wherever you sit. And if we don't bring that to the table, I think with anything you do in development, you will fail. So I actually think it is better to understand the different things. I think these kind of conferences are good to compare notes how systems work, but also the interlanguages. And this is what you need. Because I think that, as, as you say, it, on one end, it is a relatively new uh, thing, but it is not really new because a lot has been understood. But what we need to see is that there are very many of the things where we actually need to, uh, uh, to see how we reach better the people, how we get targeted, and, and particularly uh, make sure where the most vulnerable are. I think uh, as, as an orientation, I would say you need to look at the, at the poor, the extreme poor. And if we have had 100 million people extreme poor, then our work is cut out for this, and then we need to focus on this. So I, I would uh, really strongly push back that uh, this is overload, is too much, and we, we cannot deal with it. That is capitulating uh, in front of, of a challenge we have collectively to face. And I think what is the good news here, and you saw, I think, quite a bit of energy on, on, on thing. It is possible. So we should not uh, get in this is overload. This is, if we put our minds on this, we can devise systems. We have digital means. We have registration means. We can learn from each other to do it. So I actually think it is. Um, I'm sometimes more worried about political commitment. I'm sometimes worried uh, about uh, uh, a commitment to gender only in international speeches or on paper, but not living it. That are my worries and the exclusion of girls from schools and, 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 and having a chance in life. That is where, where we have to fight that. And I think the systems we can put in place. So I actually really think this type of conference, but also for the bank, but also is we need to push much, much harder to get this, uh, uh, you know, worldwide expanded and actually more effective. Oh, thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, maybe if you would take a measure of uh, the COVID-19 uh, consequences on the social scale. I mean, the amount of child labor has increased, uh, which is sort of, you know, uh, a quick um, uh, no-go area. But um, it is just a question if families don't have enough money, kids uh, need to try and earn money. But if we can dare at there we collectively have to engage much more in advocacy and, and, and call it out what it is. Because if uh, this is, we sometimes, I feel also in, in, in the back, for example, on the gender uh, uh, agenda, this is not only acting integrated in your operation, do the analytical work, it is equally important to be very strong in the advocacy because it is not enough just to have an academic piece of paper. It is basically being in the advocacy mode. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just sort of trying to close that issue, but Sorry. thank you for, no, no, thank you for, for jumping in here. Uh, and I'd like to sort of uh, move on and talk about something that you mentioned, you have mentioned uh, already in, in your first intervention, but I'd like to sort of dig a bit, a bit deeper um, when you were talking about alignment of interventions. I mean, I know that you talked about finance, but still, let, let's start out again. How are the different ministry and the development partners cooperating. I mean, is, is, is it too much at the moment? Maybe. Uh, 
Oui, je... Yes, yes, it's true that I referred to these methodologies of alignment between the different ministries and uh, the different partners. This is a framework strategy that we have put in place. Well, defining priorities at the mid and uh, short term is very important when it comes to social protection issues. And we defined those priorities in a framework of three years. And there was a priority action plan that was budgeted with coherent actions aligned with the national strategy for social protection. And all the parties that were going to invest in social protection have to be aligned uh, on those priorities. And then the... Um, sector or linear ministries, they have to formulate their projects and then they are uh, joining a three-year investment program which is discussed together with Partners for Development. And uh, it is discussed in order to uh, make it part of the annual budget. Now the difficulties is uh, that certain projects are are supposed to be part of this programming, and they're not. So today, we have the possibility to have a look uh, at the entire uh, multiplicity of projects and uh, the different sectors that are considered so that we can ensure coherence when it comes to the different interventions amongst partners. So if we do have this temporary framework, this timeline, and this good consideration, well, then we will not have any alignment program, pro, uh, problems between the different partners for development and the state. Thank you. Uh, for that, uh, uh, Shazia, um, uh, one of the aspects, uh, and we started off uh, talking about uh, the issues of floods, of droughts uh, that Pakistan is experiencing, um, so the, the climate risks um, that you're facing, um, and how are you sort of embedding that into the social protection systems? Um, you've mentioned a number of aspects before, but can you maybe sort of pinpoint it to the climate um, bit a bit more? And are there plans to further the alignment of social protection and climate risk financing? Yes, this is very important. And we started uh, with the climate crisis um, and how Pakistan has been suffering. We are not the culprits, but we are the victims for sure. Unfortunately, Pakistan ranks, and I repeat at the cost of repeating, amongst the 10 most vulnerable countries that has to bear the brunt of practices that are not ours. Mm. We contribute less than 1% to the greenhouse carbon emissions. But unfortunately, we, we go through a lot. Now, this is a very sort of passionate and emotional issue for me because I was hit by the 2022 flood as a resident of the my home district, Sanghar, which is uh, in Sindh. I was also hit in 2020, uh, the same home district. I was hit in 2011, the same district. So I, for one, have seen pain firsthand. When I talk to you, I mean, I have the, the courage to talk today, but believe you me, I never had this courage when I was going through this. There, it took me months and months to settle with the fact that this is reality and we'd be facing it, you know, more than once in life. At least in my lifetime, I've seen three floods. So it's really, really devastating. The amount of pain and misery, the way women suffer, the way children suffer, and the way animals suffer. I mean, the suffering is beyond anyone's imagination, and I cannot explain in words. I do say at this forum, and I, I'm not trying to offend anyone, but I want to repeat that we are not the culprits yet, the worst victims of climate crisis. Now, how are we going to look at it? Um, it's something new for us, but like I said, uh, the significance is not new for us. Uh, when we are talking today, you know that uh, at the last COP uh, in Egypt, COP 27, and after the, uh, the meetings at, at uh, UN level, Pakistan's foreign minister was able to get this on the agenda for COP 27, which was loss and damage fund. Finally, we 
we have this good news that there is a fund for loss and damage for countries which are so vulnerable like us and others. Uh, but maybe I would like to take this opportunity to remind everybody that we need to make sure that that happens. Just the creation of fund on a paper is not the relief that Pakistan feels today. We would. We are not only talking for ourselves, we are talking for all the vulnerable countries. We are talking for all the countries that are vulnerable and yet have little or no role in the devastation that is, being, that is now created and the monster standing before us. So um, while we have uh, you know, a vibrant risk financing, syst financing system in place, which is more traditional in nature, like, you know, the death, injury, illness, and loss of movable and immovable assets um, insurance. But we do have to work towards the, the greater climate finance uh, 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 risk management or how to go about it. At Benazir Income Support Program, we would like to explore this, uh, this subject more. We would like to invite everyone to help us sort of work towards this and sort of create something because, and why I say this, because at the social protection um, uh, from that angle, it is the most vulnerable population that, that has to bear the brunt of everything. So adaptive social protection is the way forward if we want to deal with the, any kind of shock. But because we are talking about climate shock, and the most vulnerable communities. Even today when I'm talking to you, the coast of Pakistan is being affected. Mm -hmm. The poor people in Pakistan are being affected. Their animals are being affected. Their livelihoods are being affected. So it is very important, whenever we talk about climate crisis, we cannot separate the adaptive social protection from it. So any plan, any strategy that we are going to be making or drafting to address the issue of climate crisis, adaptive social protection has to be the crux of it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I would Climate like justice is what we need. <laughs> <laughs> we got that. <laughs> I'd like to roll the ball over to Sonia Schulz, uh, who, of course, in, in her political career has also been a minister for the environment and therefore been at COP. And, and uh, I know that uh, you were all for the creation of the loss and damages, and we got it um, at uh, COP27. So, so now COP28 just needs to um, uh, bring that on. But again, uh, and that's, that was your statement, how are we going to marry? I mean, how, what is Germany doing to marry the uh, social protection with climate risk financing? Yeah, we started in our G7 presidency to, to bring together the, the expansion of climate risk uh, financing with the expansion of adaptive social protection systems that needs to go hand in hand. And that is uh, what we, we have in the declaration. But declaration means paper. Uh, after that, that needs uh, action. And that is what I, what my ministry, what, what I drive forward um, now. We, we strengthen all our bilateral activities. We do that with Pakistan. We do that also with, with a lot of other um, of our partner countries. We 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 were one of the countries who prepared the way for the global shield against uh, climate risk, and that it was really important that we develop this shield with the We20, with the most vulnerable countries. That was. And working together on this yes, uh, adaptive system uh, to work against um, um, climate risk. Um, that is another step forward. Um, uh, we we also calling for, for the importance of social protection systems like we do today um, and bring that together with um, the um, climate action and bringing that together. And I think uh, what you said that it is that it is more than uh, just talking. We need more action. That is one of the, the things we do here in the conference, having an exchange between all the experts, bringing ideas forward, um, bringing people together who need to work together. That is something that that needs to be done, and uh, we we try to bring that forward. And um, Axel said that before. I would underline that. There is no time to lose. We must act now. We must leave no one behind. And we are not on track on the SDG. So that means um, making more to get on back on track. Uh, uh, we have 
just five years, so a little bit more than, than five years to, to, to reach that. And uh, so we need to do more than we do in the, in the first half of um, the, the SDGs to, to reach it. And that is uh, what we, we try to bring forward from the German side. Thank you so much. Axel, um, you've, you've enumerated a couple of points which are a little bit outside of the box, so I, I more or less challenge you to do the same now. Um, is there anything uh, in the scenario of future adaptive social protection financing um, that we have to think along something that you haven't heard? I mean, we have talked about climate financing, that's essential, but maybe from an Eagle's point of view, what do we also need to think about? I think that, uh, well, you need to keep the strategic perspective where you want to go, and it is ultimately about people we want to reach. And as long as there are too many people excluded, uh, we haven't uh, done the job. The second thing is when we talk about financing, I'm stressing that everywhere it needs to be additional. Uh, there is too much thinking is that uh, to rob Peter to pay Paul and then you declare success but you have just uh, scored the purest victory and you didn't change life for these people. And so additionality is going to be important and you need also that everybody needs to do something. And it's in the governments I think uh, that is uh, whether people like it or not uh, people will need to pay taxes wherever you are sit in the world. And you cannot run a system with 5 or 6% of GDP in taxes. It is not possible. So you will need, and there has been a lot of discussion to get to uh, at least the taxation level in the order of 15% of GDP or so, but a lot of countries are way below it. And, and then you ask yourself, well, you cannot ask the international to community to pay uh, for the services your own citizens are refused to pay. And so you need to, to uh, the DRM or the domestic resource is prominent. You can, uh, and, and why do I say it? Because you need to create sustainable systems. Cannot be just a, a quick, uh, a, you know, sprint and then you're exhausted and the system fall apart. So that is uh, very important. Uh, secondly, I think if you look at the international support, everybody is stressed. I don't need to ask you, but, but basically <laughs> the, the, the fiscal systems are stressed here, they are stressed anywhere you look. So the, one of the things, and today we are going to publish this, and we call that detox development. And it is about subsidies. So it's not now raising revenues, it is looking what is happening to sub subsidies. Today, as we speak, there are seven trillion dollars of subsidies, about 8% of the global GDP. Now, many of the subsidies are inefficient and harmful, like that you need to subsidize some diesel or some environmentally uh, you know, damaging activities. There are also still agricultural subsidies that destroy the livelihood in poor countries. Also not a smart thing. What about thinking, I'm thinking out loud, it's not an official World Bank uh, recommendation. <laughs> I hope that it so will gonna, be. We can, gonna but cut that let out. me just say, <laughs> what about if you were to say out of the seven trillion, you reserve one trillion for precisely, for example, the climate-related activities. That would be a big deal because it would protect a lot of things and you could do the, some of the adaptation work that's necessary in, Afghan, in, in Pakistan, but also elsewhere in the world. So one of the things is we may need also to start rethinking of repurposing, you know, totally damaging subsidies into uh, a, a more productive area, and it will uh, probably trigger a robust debate, and some people will say, this guy is nuts, so that's my, my name is Axel, so then you know who's nuts, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically, I think we need to, uh, uh, I think what it also means is we need to start thinking very differently. 
and, 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 and at sometimes that is uneasy. You will need to get out of the comfort zone, whether that is a World Bank or another organization. Uh, if we are thinking we can just uh, plug on and we are happy and we have here a conference there and have a, we're just failing. I think we need to keep in mind there is total urgency and there is a need to act and we need to be credible with a critical mass of money. And we need to start thinking on how you, you, you mobilize that. Not easy, it's never easy, but uh, I think if we don't give that a fighting chance, then basically we're really not doing our jobs. So I think this is wherever we are. And I think what is, again, important that with this type of conferences, but also the activities, that it is doable. And I think we need to uh, leave with this adaptation idea. Social protection needs to be seen in a dynamic way. You cannot just cement it and believe that this for the next generation is it. It will need to be constantly adapted to new challenges. I think the COVID crisis has shown how dramatically uh, the whole game plan changes, and therefore to come with marginal changes is a joke. We need to have far bigger changes, and that uh, will require uh, in the whole development field to, to take this forward. And I personally, I hope that will be part of a discussion also in September when there is the stock taking of the SDGs. Because when you talk about five years, my own assessment, I would love to see by 2030 the progress. I have my doubts. That doesn't mean that we should not accelerate it, but there should be this doubling down of efforts and not to say, oh, well, we we'll just fly in, get some more uh, CO2 in the air towards New York, and then are happy. We need basically to say, look, can we do it? And I think on the subsidies, there I think is an area where we can have a critical dis uh, discussion how we could maybe face some of the most harmful things of it and redirect it to the high priority areas, including in developing countries. Thank you so much. And no, that was not the last statement uh, that we will have heard. Um, uh, we're, but still, we're coming towards the end of the panel discussion. And we would love to hear before uh, Minister Schulz and uh, Axel von Schwarzenberg will have their last statements, but later on at the uh, lectern. Uh, we would like to hear from uh, both of you, from Pakistan and from Senegal. Um, at the end of this conference, uh, w what are your takeaways? Um, I, I know, uh, Minister Murray, we, we've heard that you can actually share a lot of info, uh, but I'm quite sure that uh, these last three days, uh, certainly you and your delegation have also interacted with others, so I'm quite sure that you are going home whenever you go home uh, uh, with a couple of hopefully new ideas or new inspiration, and the same, uh, Mr. Dio, for you. Maybe we start with Minister Murray. Um, thank you very much, and uh, I go home tomorrow, so just <laughs> for your information. Um, yes, um, uh, once again, I would like to uh, reiterate, I would like to appreciate this event and um, everyone who's made this possible, uh, uh, Minister Scholz and uh, World Bank, GIZ, and I'm also grateful to the development partners who have been working with us, particularly the, uh, World Bank, GIZ, over a long period of time, and there are great initiatives that we work together on. Now, this kind of a forum gives us more opportunity to learn and you know, there are takeaways, of course. Uh, like I said earlier, I talked about the government-led adaptive social protection effort. Pakistan is already working on this, and Pakistan would like to sort of further invest in the knowledge regarding the same. And uh, this investment is what we all need to make. We need to learn more, and we need to equip ourselves more for many, many shocks, God forbid, that we are to face or our populations have to face. Um, and effective payment delivery systems, robust financing mechanisms, the social registry, we already have one, and it keeps evolving. It's become more flexible in Pakistan, so we've moved from static to dynamic, and you know that, that is an achievement. Uh, 
loss and damage uh, uh, fund and uh, you know mitigate the effects of climate change. Uh, so these are all the takeaways and I'm very happy to also once again say that Pakistan wants to be uh, you know, an active partner in this whole activity of uh, formulating different models for adaptive social protection. We want to learn and we want to share and we want to actually lead an exercise like this. So, you know, maybe on this similar model of South to South cooperation uh, model, we can work together. We'll be happy to work with, with anyone who wants to sort of work with us in trying to develop models at, in, in their home countries. So we want to offer this, we want to take lead in this, and this is one sort of uh, important message that I would like to give to everyone. Gender responsive strategies we have uh, already uh, in place in the country, but we want to evolve, we want to sort of improve upon that. So once again, thank you. We go back with a lot of knowledge, and we also are happy to share. My team was here um, from uh, uh, different provinces, um, from Islamabad, the capital, and uh, it has been a great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci beaucoup. Moi, je crois que je vais repartir. Thank you, thank you very much. I would like to leave the forum repeating the message from the representative of the World Bank about the need to create a space to uh, align our policies, but also a taxation system that does not go against growth, because we cannot have a social protection system without uh, sustainable growth. So we need uh, to review the policy for subsidies in a rational way. Uh, we have suppressed some subsidies for the energy sector, but this happened at a moment where we needed to restore the competitiveness of companies and we needed to generate growth. So it is difficult today to create new taxes. It's delicate to do so in an open economy context, but yeah, but we need to, to, to do that. And uh, the leverage that we have today is that, yes, we need to make sure of the efficacy, of the effectiveness of reforms, the reforms for social security grants and uh, these reforms are going to allow us to make savings and to to scale up our response to the targets. So my message is just to pursue our work and, of course, to always take in mind this gender approach. Today, the assembly is uh, mixed. I mean, we have a parity. We have 50% women and 50% men. And this is the dynamic in Senegal. And we want to foster the presence of women. And the second line is the digital line. Today, we have young people who are literate, digitally di literal, literate. And we need to be able to to touch upon this, and uh, we need uh, to uh, have an effect on the vulnerable ones uh, thanks to the digital technologies. Thank you very much. At, uh, we have finished our panel discussion, um, and I'd like to ask three people to come down with me so that Axel can go to the lectern. And uh, could you just sort of, for the end of the panel discussion, sort of give everybody uh, a round of applause, please? <laughs> And with that, ich hole dich nachher noch mal hoch. Yeah. Um, could we sort of step down? Thank you so much uh, for all your input, your valuable I input. I congratulate you for moderating this. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. <laughs> but uh, Axel, this is yours, um, certainly for the next uh, couple of minutes. And uh, we step down, we listen to you. Can I bring my bag? Yes, of course. Sorry, I'm just going to help the lady grab her bag. Thanks. Just one second. He's not.
Well, this is the beauty of, uh, of a conference at the end where you are exhausted and you say, yeah, now I have to sit through another speech and listen politely and, and then you say, can he stop quickly? So I, I swear, I, I keep this speech here nicely because I think that indeed Colin and Esther did a, a wonderful job to summarize and, and, and they were there, but uh, I think they captured uh, also the dynamism of your discussion. And I think it's very important that um, uh, this, uh, these remarks uh, are kept and taken ba back home. Because my first message is really a message of urgency. Wherever you sit on social protection and development, we need to actually bring this back that actually the situation is serious. And therefore, actually, we need to take action wherever you are sitting. And therefore, I think I hope that this kind of conference can also serve a little bit that you are a champion for change, a champion for urgency, because whether we like it or not, it's burning. And so that is my, my first message. You can look at all the nice things, but the, the main part is, and for me, there's always a stark reminder. If there are 100 million people uh, extreme poor, in addition, that uh, if compared to 2020, we have a problem. We are not going into the right direction, and therefore we need to act. So that is my first, my urgency. And secondly, nobody should be left behind. And whatever we do, we need to design this in, in, with this in mind. We have all these crises. We need to uh, see the inclusion. And here I would like to raise a specific issue with the FCB, the uh, fragile countries. This is a very difficult problem, and I think that is where the extreme poor are and will be concentrated. Just to keep you, by 2030, we expect that about more than half of the extreme poor will be in the FCV. Now, here is your challenge also for the uh, social protection system. How do we do that when we are sometimes uh, not able to support them because of conflict or about fighting, and how do you can still do this? This is one of the areas where, for example, with the UN system, we have been working, for example, in Yemen, but there are more fundamental questions. What I have seen in our work, concretely, in the Sahel zone, what do you do if then all out of a sudden there is a coup d'etat and then all out of a sudden these programs are getting stranded. But yet social protection is, ba uh, uh, is based on long-term engagement, but also ownership. And if you switch off, like you uh, switch off the light, you destroy an entire system or an entire dialogue. So I just want to leave you with this, that this nobody should be left behind is an extremely difficult issue, particularly in the FCV countries, and we need to think and debate it how we can help them. The other one is what you have seen, the dialogue is necessary, and I would still say we need the advocacy, because quite frankly, on the women and girls, we are still far from it, and we have now seen extreme uh, reversals like in Afghanistan. So what are we doing there? And there we need basically to say that if we want to be successful, we need to be loud and clear on this uh, and, and then actually see that inclusiveness has a meaning and it's not just writing on this. The next point I just made before, but it is uh, often forgotten, the additionality. The additionality is really an issue because right now when you are looking in Africa where the ODA flows to sub-Saharan Africa are falling, then when we are talking about additionality, it is a problem. We have been uh, raising uh, uh, and, and successfully having large IDA replenishment. That is okay as long as the rest is also doing more because if we are replacing our resources 
and then and somebody is taking um, their resources out, we have a problem. And unfortunately, we see that in some of the FCV countries. So additionality is key. And also one, and this was mentioned by uh, a, a couple of speakers, is uh, the need to scale up. I think there is huge demand, and what we need to really need to see is how we can actually broaden this. There are often, or including in the World Bank, too many projects that are indeed covering this, and when you go on a visit, we can declare victory for this, but we need then to say, are we reaching the critical mass that, of people that we need to reach? And then we need to think, do we have the right design in there. And particularly designing scaled up systems is difficult. But I think we need to go through it. Therefore, this learning exercise and this exchange is so important of the dialogue because we need to think, can you reach in, 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 in countries where there are weaker systems, can we reach uh, maybe a, a large percentage of the population? I think it was also mentioned today, and we have a lot of discussion within the bank, is the data. The data revolution is just massive. It's not only digital, but how can we use data to reach uh, this and implement it. We have now, you have seen it with registration, big advances. How can we actually really uh, uh, see this as an incredible opportunity? But uh, again, here we need also to reach out to other groups to see how we could think it. We have been uh, doing it in the bank, uh, uh, certainly on data. Uh, we are also even looking at AI, how we can uh, uh, involve this. There are huge opportunities, and that is what we actually need to lo uh, look at. Then I think an, an other important thing is partnerships. I think this is the partnership in the dialogue, but the partnership also in action. The difficulty today is nobody can do it alone, and sometimes you hope that you could do it, you cannot do it alone. And so therefore, how can we best uh, uh, work together uh, that can be with bilateral partners, that can be with multilateral partners, the private sector, it is with research institute. I think we shouldn't have too many uh, prejudices. What should drive is good ideas. And I think then we need to actually uh, together have an open mind to evaluate. And, and I, in that context, I think we need to see also again with data how we can improve uh, impact evaluation. Impact evaluation is a very uh, useful thing, but it can be very expensive. Now, I've been also within the bank been saying, with all this data, can we actually build already in the design of projects uh, you know, uh, monitoring devices that helps us learn the whole time. And I think that is something we need to think, particularly social protection, because don't forget, you can with social protection reach people. Uh, in the bank, thanks to the last couple of years that country had built systems, we were able to reach with the money that we provided then, uh, a billion people, that uh, not the bank reaching, but the systems that we were supporting. So it, 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 that's the good news on this. But maybe if we were to be better, we could have a, a, a collective, we could have reached maybe one and a half billion. I don't know, but basically that's what we know. The final thing is we need to see that this is ultimately building the ecosystem of social protection, starting with the political commitment, because that we need on the sustainable. We need to be driven by sustainability, resilience, and inclusion in that. And, and, and they have all to be integrated in whatever we do on this, because otherwise the system is weakened. And it requires also uh, then uh, uh, the complement of revenue uh, uh, generation in the countries, 
but also more effective expenditure policies. Because I think, uh, as, uh, as we all know, there, there are scarce resources, so there is a need to optimize on this. Uh, and finally, uh, just go home and make, uh, try to write some op-eds, how important it is, what you can learn in Berlin, enjoy it, the, 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 the hospitality of the ministry. Let me again uh, uh, ask you for a hand of applause to, uh, to uh, uh, Svetja and the whole team who were so nice to host us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and that's probably going to be my shortest introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back on stage, our Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development, Svenja Schulze. Excellency colleagues, dear Axel, it's always a pleasure to do such uh, important conferences together with the World Bank, so and thanks a lot for this working together. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this conference was with all your valuable contributions, has shown us how fundamentally important a social protection is for, for people in the complex work world that we now live in. And we, we all appreciate this uh, summarized 20-minute uh, um, summarization from, from Esther and, and Cohen. Um, new risks call for, for new innovative approaches and additional financing for social protection. And the basis for this is a solid and yet at the same time adaptive system of social protection. And the aim is to strengthen resilience and make sure that people will also be better able to get through crises in the future. So in order to achieve that, the building blocks we have talked about at this conference will be needed. That is absolutely clear. They can be used to set up the kind of uh, social protection systems that were presented to us here uh, at this conference. Such systems are inclusive and they take the role of girls and women into a particular account. The, gu the gender guidance note for social protection, which uh, Germany supports and which we are currently discussing and drafting with our partners, can play a part in this. The systems are needs oriented, adaptive, and, and forward looking. Digital technologies are a key factor for that, and in order to reach people according to their needs, we need good data and transparent administrative and payment systems. Uh, Axel mentioned that a minute before. In, in cooperation with Switzerland, for example, we are supporting the free and open source information system, Open IMIS, and the system can be used to improve the management of health insurance and, and social uh, programs. The systems are multi-sectoral and they also uh, react in particular to climate-related uh, loss and damage, and this is an area where particularly we want to make use of the global shield for social protection in order to, to increase resilience and provide a safety net against the threats of uh, climate risk. The system has uh, sufficient funding, that was also an, an, uh, a, a discussion here, uh, given the global crises and the enormous social challenges that we are seeing, uh, expectations for social protection systems are really high, and I really love the expression from Axel to say we need a, a detoxing our systems and look where we can get the money that is needed. And you know, you know all, at the same time, the financial resources are limited, and that is why uh, we need also uh, support uh, our partners in their efforts to make their systems more efficient and more effective and a system in mobilizing additional domestic resources in order to stabilize and expand their social protection systems. And the systems are built on, on efficient partnership and in that regard I had announced in my opening stand, uh, statement that we have launched a new international partnership between the World Bank and the ILO and that is just the beginning. We need more of these uh, partnerships. Uh, the colleagues in our panel discussions uh, just sh now showed that it is not just our partners in the Global South who need to do more in order to make social protection more universal and more adaptive. 
the development partners must also look at what we can do here uh, better. And I am therefore really pleased that, as we just heard once again from Axel and from Gilbert Umbro, the World Bank as the biggest financer for social protection and the United Nations with uh, its uh, diverse range of support programs are going to bring their strengths together in, in order to be able to provide even better and more uh, effective support. And um, ladies and gentlemen, to be very clear, we are not planning to create any new time-consuming, high-cost instruments in, in order to do that. Uh, instead, we want to make efficient and effective use of the existing financing mechanisms of the World Bank and the UN system. The bit which is new is that we are going to link them with the joint coordination structure at the global level, and we are also going to tie them in with concrete country approaches. And by doing that, we will be able to make better use of their um, comparative uh, strengths. So it is especially important to me that the Global South is in the driving seat, not just for the implementation part, but also during the selection and the design phases. Um, together with the UN organization and the World Bank, we are already talk talking to potential partner countries in the Global South in order to set up a, a pilot phase. I, I therefore call again on other development donors to make political and financial contributions in the new initiative to just hear uh, how to do that, detoxing, uh, phasing out uh, uh, um, uh, subsidies that harms. <laughs> it sounds so easy, <laughs> and I know how hard that is. So it is important that we make sure there is a viable financial basis for the next few years, and I'm pleased that I have already received positive signals in this regard from some of the participants that is another good outcome from the last couple of days, and we too want to make further contributions. At this conference, we have reached a, a common understanding, and we have forged alliances of donors and partners from the Global South, and I'm, I'm certain that this will mean that we are able to make further progress towards universal social protection at the SDG Summit in New York this autumn. Ladies and gentlemen, in it has once more been made clear at this conference that social protection is an investment that pays off, an investment in a sustainable future, a future that will also benefit the generations to come. Without, with that thought, I would like to officially close this conference, but our joint efforts for universal social protection for all people will continue with full forces. And I would like to thank all the people who make this conference possible, who run this conference, uh, our translators, all the people in the back that we don't see. Uh, a big applause for all the ones who make that possible. And, and also a big applause to, to our moderator, Konik Shima, who brings us to this conference just in time. <laughs> and thank you all for joining this conference. It was really amazing to have you all here. And thank you very much for this fruitful discussion. Thank you.